Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second ICLR Encounters, um, a series of small, mobile, intelligent discussions about legal concepts and how we write about them. Uh, my name is Paul McGrath. I'm um, Head of Product Development and Online Content at ICLR, the Incorporated Council of Law Reporting for England and Wales. We're responsible for reporting the most important cases, the ones which set precedents so that barristers and judges can use them in court and students can read about the law. Um, so we've got a discussion this evening. Uh, the subject is justice on trial. Now, the courts sit in public, but do the public sit in court? Uh, does the press cover the court in the way that it should, or even in the way that it used to? Um, do the media connive in order to enhance the value of uh, such scoops as they may obtain? Will cameras in court make a difference? Will they add to public understanding, or will they merely add to the diet of reality on TV? Um, what you might call the only way is Essex County Court. Um, well, to discuss these matters, we have um, in the red corner, Matthew Ryder QC, a barrister from Matrix Chambers, who has a track record of uh, dealing with controversial cases. And in the blue corner, uh, Martin Beckford from the Daily Telegraph, um, who has a track record of writing about controversial cases. And to umpire the match between them with judicial impartiality, we have Joshua Rosenberg, a widely respected legal commentator, who is the presenter of BBC's Law in Action. Uh, and now, without more ado, I'm going to hand over to Joshua Rosenberg to chair this evening's discussion on justice on trial. Thank you very much. Paul, thank you very much indeed uh, for that introduction. Uh, as Paul has explained, we have two excellent speakers. Um, on my right um, is, is uh, uh, Martin Beckford, who uh, joined the Telegraph a um, um, little while before I left. He, he was on the way up when I was on the way out. Um, he was, he's now Home Affairs Editor at the Daily Telegraph, and he previously spent um, almost two years at the Old Bailey, uh, not in the dock, but on the press bench, uh, working for Central News Agency, where he covered terrorism cases. Uh, the um, number of reporters at the courts has declined in recent years, unfortunately, um, and uh, those who are there are very special indeed and very, very important. Um, one of the people he will have seen in court is Matthew Ryder, barrister at Matrix Chambers, who specializes in criminal law and its overlap with civil cases, including public law and human rights. Um, he has particular ex expertise in cases involving terrorism, fraud, police powers, freedom of expression. Um, he has also uh, appeared um, at the Leveson Inquiry uh, and uh, represented a couple of people there. He represented the family of Ian Tomlinson at the inquest into his death. Um, he dealt with a, a claim of harassment relating to reporting by the Daily Mail. Uh, he was called to the bar in 1992 and took silk uh, in 2010, a couple of years ago, and has appeared before the Supreme Court, European Court of Human Rights, International Criminal Court in The Hague, as well as cases in uh, the Court of Appeal, Trials and Inquests. So, very distinguished panel. Now, the um, subject matter um, on the flyer um, is fairly concise. Uh, it was, will cameras in the courts increase public awareness? Is this then polarized by the, secrets, the secret court's agenda? And is freedom of speech really freedom of speech, even with the proposed new defamation bill? Um, I was very impressed with the fact that an organization which is dedicated to law reporting, reporting the courts, has chosen three bills before Parliament as a subject matter for tonight's debate. Uh, first of all, the uh, Crime and Courts Bill, which is it, it, at its... Uh, Committee stage in the House of Lords, that's the one that uh, introduces cameras in courts to some extent. Secret courts agenda is the Justice and Security Bill, um, also in its committee stage in the House of Lords. Um, and the Defamation Bill is the one that started in the House of Commons um, and is pretty well through its committee stage. Uh, and uh, we will be talking, I think, a little bit about all of those three. So let us start, though, um, with cameras in court. Let's start with the Crime and Courts Bill. This has 
a clause, Clause 22, uh, which is pretty much enabling legislation. It enables um, the Lord Chancellor by order to uh, provide that the restrictions on filming and uh, photography and sketching in courts and sound recordings um, don't apply to prescribed circumstances. However, um, in order to ensure the fairness of any proceedings um, and in order to ensure that any person is not unduly prejudiced, the court may direct that that is disapplied in relation to those proceedings. So if the court thinks that uh, photography uh, should be banned despite the fact that there's open house, um, then the judge can say so. So, um, uh, Martin Beckford, you are a journalist. Um, although you work for a newspaper, that newspaper was one of the earliest to go online and it does... Um, uh, television uh, films on the internet, and indeed we all know that uh, there is this convergence between the print media and the broadcast media, so that the print newspapers provide websites with video, and the uh, broadcasters provide websites with words. So presumably, um, if you're in the, the media business, um, you're pretty much in favour of cameras in court. Um, well, you might think so, but I'm afraid not. It's, you might say it's to do with my sort of territorial instincts that I print media see themselves against broadcast media and particularly when you go when you cover court cases the people who've been there with their short hundred words a minute shorthand and their notepads for weeks on end uh, get a bit resentful when all the BBC turn up on the last day and uh, none of them know short, shorthand and they uh, you know they fill out all the press benches and try to talk to each other all the way through the case so there is a bit of resentment between us but um, setting that aside I think that um, I can't see that it would really enhance anyone's uh, understanding of justice if, if the courts were televised, because the, the main re reason is it's all been just lobbying by the BBC, ITN and Sky to get this to happen, and uh, I don't think there's any real public clamour for it to happen. Matthew Ryder, what about the position of your clients if you're defending, or indeed if you're prosecuting? Um, have they any interest in um, their trials being televised? No. I mean, I think the um, benefit of this legislation is not for the defendant. Um, most defendants um, are intimidated enough when they're faced with being in court, um, usually for something which they wish nobody really knew about. Um, many people, if they had the opportunity, would not even want their name disclosed. And so the prospect of them uh, being on television in the, probably the worst moments of their life is something they'd want to avoid at all costs. And so normally a barrister is instructed to try and prevent that from happening at all costs. Um, um, to be fair, I don't think the government is necessarily going to uh, allow defendants to be shown. It's going to start with the judges summing up and maybe sentencing and, and so on and starting with appeals. Well, provisions, I think, appeals and then sentences next, yes. I think, and then maybe summing up after that. Hmm. Um, but my position um, as a lawyer is um, a little bit different. Uh, I think that it is not possible to put forward a really coherent argument against cameras in court as a matter of principle. If we believe in open justice and we believe that theoretically anybody could walk in off the street and watch what's happening in court, then in theory you'd need to put forward a good reason why a camera couldn't be in there. Now, all that, tells, all that means really is that my starting point is a presumption in favour of televising or reporting or tweeting or anything of that kind. But I think it's perfectly legitimate to say that presumption can be rebutted or set aside. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily be a huge burden on the judge to say in this particular case, in these particular circumstances, I think that the administration of justice, the normal sequence of the trial, the way someone might feel giving their evidence, will be affected to the detriment of justice by having this televised. And so it may be that although there would be a presumption that's quite easily rebutted, subject to the, the important public interest of a case and things of that kind. I mean, it strikes me that the courts themselves, the judges themselves, are pretty keen on this. I mean, uh, for me, it's part of a bigger, a bigger discussion, which is that um, when I started at the bar, um, the only way you'd get access to uh, cases was through the ICLR, was through the law reports. And um, it was a kind of golden era, of the end of a golden era, for the established law reports, where they had a virtual monopoly, really, on the knowledge of cases that were out there. And so, whereas now, anybody studying law will begin online and accessing, and most of the students here will be accessing the case online, 
I'm old enough to, to have started out when you'd have to spend a weekend photocopying cases from you know, pulling them off the shelf and, and finding them in these bound volumes. And if a chamber's greatest asset um, was, was to be chosen, it would have been these kind of bound volumes of law reports because you couldn't get access to these cases anywhere else. Are, are we allowed to mention Bailey in these surroundings? Well, I was going to say, <laughs> now, you know, that's all changed. And what you've ended up with now is an openness about law reports and um, you know, Bailey and these other online resources are this huge open resource for virtually every case that's decided. Case track, you know, law tell, whoever you want to check. Now, but, but, but let me give you the chance to say that there is a difference between Bailey and ICLR. Well, reports. I was going to say, I think the, the, the really important thing in that regard, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll explain the parallel to what we're talking about, the really important thing to that regard is that there's an editorial judgment that goes into law reporting that is really, really important. When you get a law report, I'm not saying this cause, just because we're in here and they're the host, but you know, it helps to flatter your host. But, but the reality is, is that when you get a law report that's by the proper law reporters, it is set out in a particular way that the right cases are chosen. And in the blizzard of legal information that we get, every single day, you know, tens of cases that could be of importance come at you. You need someone to edit them for you and put them in a kind of digestible form, right? Otherwise, you just you're at sea with all the information. My own view is it's going to be the, it is the same with the actual reporting of trials when it comes to television or whether it comes to tweeting or whatever. It will be opened up. It's inevitable. You have to open up the legal system and there'll be huge amounts of people wanting to report on trials. But the, the, what we need is people that will be able to edit and present those well. And that may be the Telegraph, it may be the BBC, it may be the Guardian, maybe whoever. But I think it will be the merit of the quality of judgment in that reporting that will stand out. And I think the idea that you can ensure that by blocking access is, an, is a, from a bygone era. Where, where the great reporters will rise to the top, and I think the ICLR survival indicates that, is by showing that there is a value in somebody who knows what they're talking about, can edit the information, and get you what you need, and isn't going to televise that silly, ridiculous case in the middle of Harrow Crown Court that no one cares mm. about, but is going to televise that important case somewhere which might, other people might, might not realise is as important as it is. Martin, let's take the example of a decision by the Supreme Court last week. Um, this was a Scottish case, and it was about the rights of cohabitants in Scotland. Mm. Um, and not least because there was a judgment on the same day from Glenn Mulcair, uh, none of us uh, about Glen Mulcair. Nobody um, took very much notice of the Scottish case. Um, and then Francis Gibb in the Times uh, got round to reading it, I suppose, on Friday, um, and wrote a piece which appeared on Monday, uh, which quoted Lady Hale as expressing her views on mm. cohabitation, saying there should be rights for cohabitants. And then other newspapers picked this up. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it? Here was a case that was in the public domain from last Wednesday, and nobody really noticed it or cared about it. That's right. And the Supreme Court is televised. And how many people watch it? How many people here have ever watched the Supreme Court televised? I mean, well, very good. Yeah, but well, that, well, you're in the business. But, yeah, that's, but, but, I mean, but, it's interesting to see because obviously you think that and, this audience would be interested. And why is the Supreme Court televised? Do you think it's all part of Sky's marketing plans to try Well, my former employee at the Bailey said that Sky will not give them, they won't share the footage, their footage of the Supreme Court because they say, well, we paid for it, so you're not having it. So open justice only, only goes. Uh, who, who, who will they not share it with? I mean, Central News. But um, what does Central News want television footage for? Well, just to, you know, to get some stills or just to, you know, live up. I mean, do, 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 are you in favour of the televising of the Supreme Court? Well, I, again, I just see that, I just don't think, you know, it may be nice in principle, but I just think there's far more important things that need to happen first before we get to televising things. I just think there's so many courts that aren't covered properly at all, and there's so many judgments that aren't, uh, heard about, and th that Supreme Court one is a good example, even though it's on TV okay, and it's judgment. But, but. Well, we have an example, because I think it's great that the Supreme Court, even though nobody watches it, you know, it's like kind of BBC News 24 at kind of three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> right? It's great that it's there, nobody watches it. But I think it's really, really good that it is there, um, because it is commensurate with the importance of our constitutional court explaining and seeing the highest judges in the country 
explaining these big points of principle and seeing who they are, seeing what they say, seeing how they say it a little bit, seeing the argument if you want to see it. And just knowing that it's, a, it's possible to do that, I think, is a, is, a, is a value. I'll give you an example of how it can work the other way. The US Supreme Court is not televised. People might think that you know, US rules of openness and First Amendment are, are broader than the US Supreme Court isn't televised. And uh, last week, or week before last week, the Obamacare oh, yeah. judgment was handed down. And I expect you probably know, but most people here might know, that Fox News and CNN got the judgment wrong for about the first 10 minutes. So whereas the Supreme Court handed down a victory to Obama, Fox News were um, reporting a defeat for Obama. Um, you know. Now, whose fault is that? Is that the fault of the Supreme Court? I mean, it gets, it gets even more remarkable because... Um, it turns out that President Obama was watching the cable television services. So he believed he'd, he'd lost. lost. <laughs> he did. Um, and his lawyers weren't um, uh, going to tell him the result until they were sure about it. And they weren't sure until about quarter past ten. And because um, Fox News and CNN, as I say, had, had taken one aspect of the case and had gone with that, um, and there's this classic thing whereby you've got the broadcaster outside the court and once she, I think it was, uh, starts broadcasting, she can't be contacted uh, on the phone by the runner inside to say, hang on, we've now turned the page and seen it says so something rather different. OK, let's move on to secret courts, um, see if you think there's anything wrong with that. Um, we've got part two of the Justice and Security Bill, uh, which has these um, restrictions on disclosure of sensitive material, proceedings in which the court permits closed material applications, um, uh, and this famous um, uh, subclause, uh, the court must, uh, on an application, make such a declaration if it considers that, and so on. In other words, not giving the judges any discretion to introduce these closed procedures in cases involving uh, national security. Um, Martin Beckford, good idea, a bad idea, problem, not as much as people have said? Well, I would say that it doesn't sound like a great idea, but the, the reality is that they already exist. And there was a, a parliamentary written answer a couple of weeks ago that disclosed that closed material procedures have been used 92 times in the SIAC um, immigration hearings in, in just the, the past five years. So to me, it's a slightly, um, you know, the, the, the argument in one way has already been lost because they're happening all the time. In fact, they couldn't count how many times they'd been used in other, in other cases. Um, so uh, the, the idea that the minister um, forces it through rather than it being the judge's discretion, that does seem to be a, a new point and... But, but in general, you're not concerned about extending closed material procedures from SIAC, Special Immigration Appeals Commission, um, uh, some terrorism cases, some immigration cases where national security is involved, to any cases uh, where you, know, you might have a former employee of MI5 who's complaining about wrongful dismissal. You might have somebody who, who claims that there's been wrongful interference. Um, you might have a very broad... Uh, question of national security um, and this is changing uh, the existing public interest immunity procedures into closed material. No, no problem? Well, not that it's no problem but I, I, I just think that it's not quite as much problem, partly as I said because they already exist and partly because I don't think they are going to be used massively widely. There was a, a judgment in um, a terrorism case the other week that relied on CMP and they published the, most of the judgment, it just said the foreign secretary ex expanded on his points in the closed hearing and, and then they moved on. You still got to find out the result of the case and um, it wasn't like the whole thing was a closed book. So I don't think they're quite the end of the world. And I, as I said before, there are far more areas of the court that are completely opaque to the public, um, such as in the court of protection and things that, that don't get the coverage that, uh, that this has. Matthew? Uh, I couldn't do I disagree more fundamentally. <laughs> um, I think that it's a completely misconceived concept within our legal system to have uh, to increase closed material procedures. They do exist in SIAC. Um, there's a very strong argument to say that within the context of SIAC, they were wrong, they don't work, and they don't create justice. And SIAC uh, at least creates a self-contained legal space 
where SIAC is a Special Immigration Appeals Commission where certain types of national security immigration cases are decided. And at, at, at least you've got some kind of containment of where you have those procedures, even though, so in other words, the, the, what I would view as a kind of festering injustice at least has kind of limits around it. Once you extend closed material procedures into civil proceedings generally, um, I think it's it, a uh, complete anathema to our legal system because our legal system is based on open justice and it's based on the idea that at the minimum, at the minimum, the people involved in the litigation can understand the evidence that is being used to determine the case either for or against them. So it's one thing to say the public might not get to hear all the details, but if you are a litigant, if you're the person on the receiving end of that judgment, and it has been decided on the basis of a section of the case which you weren't allowed to take part in, and you don't know the evidence that was called in that hearing, uh, it is not in any way a procedure which would satisfy any litigant once you've lost that case. And you know, saying, well, okay, you get the judgment back, and you know, there was a there was a line that said, you know, and the judge went into closed procedure and heard some evidence. That's the killer line. That's the bit you want to know. Okay, well, well, what what happened there? If I've lost this case, I've seen the other bits, but if I've lost this case, what what was in that bit there? I think um, one of the worst aspects of it is that this procedure is going to is proposed in cases where people are litigating against the state. And so the idea that you get the state, in this case a minister, determining when the litigant against the state should be prevented from hearing the evidence that, that would be relevant to the case, that is the most uncomfortable aspect of this, of this uh, legislation because it, it appears to be uh, a provision which our justice system is set against, which is that the state should be accountable and here you're having a situation where ministers or whoever says, well, I can keep that material out of the case. Once you have this provision in place, the, the potential for it to expand and to be used beyond national security cases or for the definition of national security cases to be stretched is there and will be, will be taken up. So I'm, I couldn't be more opposed. Let's move on to defamation before I bring in the audience. Um, we have the defamation bill, um, and it all looks very grand. Um, to some extent, it has a very slight feeling, doesn't it, that it, it's fighting last year's battle. I mean, you know, London was meant to be the libel capital of the world, and we were terribly worried about all of that, and, and we don't quite see so much uh, libel in the courts um, these days. Two cases last year, I think. It, um, it doesn't seem very many. So do we need this bill? And, and, and will this bill actually achieve very much, um, or, or will it simply restate the common law? Um, I think we do need a, a bill, and I, th I was particularly um, pleased to see um, libel reform being dealt with um, uh, in the Queen's speech. I thought it was a good thing. But when you get into the bill itself, it's um, not as, as, uh, there's not as much there as you'd want. The reality is I think there's a strand of cases to do with particularly scientific reporting that prompted... Um, uh, a real outcry about our current defamation position. And there were two things that were going on when people were giving their sort of opinion on science. The first was that they were being pursued um, very vigorously by um, well-resourced companies um, who were seeking to take them through litigation to prove their opposition on some scientific basis. And people, scientists weren't really in a position where they could afford to do that. So one of the things the bill seems to be trying to do is provide some additional safeguards, some procedural safeguards to allow scientists to have some immunity. For example, if there's, I think one of the provisions of the bill is a peer-reviewed article, will now get some immunity from defamation proceedings or some privilege in defamation proceedings. Right? Um, the other thing which the bill hasn't dealt with and can't deal with is a practice where um, well-resourced companies will pursue individuals, individual writers, rather than the newspaper. And, you know, we have a history of, if you think about it, realistically, someone who's wronged would want to pursue the um, person with the deepest pockets who could be liable. And normally that was a newspaper. Now, I don't know whether it's a reflection of newspapers not having the money that they used to, <laughs> or whether it's um, more likely feeling that if you really want to intimidate freedom of expression from scientists, 
go after them personally, make them at risk of losing their house or, or you know, becoming bankrupt if you really want to go after them. So that, that has a huge chilling effect on kind of that sort of debate. And that, that I think, is um, welcome, but I don't think the bill goes far enough in that regard. What, what I was interested in is that the, the government announced out of nowhere that it wanted um, the power for people who think they've been libeled on Facebook and <laughs> forums like that to be able to force ISPs to reveal the, the name of the, uh, the person who's, who's uh, been slagging them off online, which I just think is an incredible idea. I can't see how that's going to get very far, but it might show that, you know, as, the, as you say, the, the libel landscape is changing, and now rather than uh, having very rich people or publishers complaining about things, you now have ordinary people who are outraged by things that are said about them online and, and can't be deleted. But, but going back to the bill itself, I mean, you have got this clause here headed peer-reviewed statement, peer-reviewed statement in scientific or academic journal. Uh, the publication of a statement in a scientific or academic journal is privileged if the following conditions are met, and I won't read those out. Um, and you've also got this defense of honest opinion um, it's a de uh, defence to an action for defamation for the defendant to show that certain conditions, one, that it was a statement of opinion, two, um, that uh, uh, the statement uh, complained... Oh, can't really understand that. The second condition is the statement complained of indicated whether, in general or specific terms, the basis of the opinion. In other words, you had to say why you had that opinion. Uh, and the third is that an honest person could have held that opinion on the basis of so-and-so. It's the sort of thing that might have helped the Daily Telegraph when George Galloway came after it, uh, before your time, of course. Yeah. Um, but I was there, not um, in any way involved in the case. But it must be good for newspapers if we've got these, these um, strengthened um, opin uh, defences, even if they do draw on the existing case law. Yes, I mean, it, it does seem that, um, yeah, that, as you were saying, there haven't been quite as many... Uh, uh, high-profile cases. I think you were involved in, in one of the. Oh yeah, I mean, I did. A, I did a case of um, involving a, a partner of a politician, um, Chris Hume's partner, uh, who sued the Daily Mail for harassment to do with their reporting. Um, her name is Karina Trimmingham, and she lost. We lost the case, um, but it was it was based not on the revealing of the information that largely that there was a limb of the case. It was based on the style in which the reporting was done over a long period of time, dealing with you know special characteristics she had to do with her sexuality and other mm -hmm. things. I think... Um, Before you go on, I know yeah. you can't talk about your own client's pending cases under the bar's rules, but is that case going to the Court of Appeal? Uh, it's been appealed, so we're waiting to hear from the Court of Appeal whether they'll be... Well, whether we'll be given permission to appeal. OK, I'm sorry, I interrupted but, you. No, no, but... Um, I mean, I think the... Uh, I think you're right to say that the um, process of defamation cases and the amount of defamation cases has dwindled. I mean... Uh, subject to sort of a case like that, which is a harassment case. Um, the normal defamation case, litigation, which for which London was once famous, has really withered away. Um, where I think you're really right about it feeling like yesterday's news a bit is because I think most people here are more concerned about how the courts are dealing with Twitter and Facebook and um, that kind of publication of information. Because at the moment, it doesn't seem as though we really, the courts really have a grip on what position they want to take. On one level, for example, Twitter is perceived as being like gossip in a pub, and therefore you don't take it too seriously. So when it comes to super injunctions, don't worry if somebody um, breached the super injunction on Twitter too much because it's a bit like somebody gossiping in a pub, or don't worry if somebody says something on Twitter because it's not taken too seriously for contempt purposes. But the reality, or you know, prejudicing a trial, but the reality is, is that some things that are published on Twitter can be very, very serious, and there is the scope for someone publishing things on Twitter to be breaching injunctions. Mm -hmm. So quite how the courts are getting their head around Twitter and Facebook isn't in that bill in any meaningful way. I think you're right, and I think that's the kind of frontier of publication that we're going to have to kind of grapple with over the next you know, five, ten years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you saw that last year there was, I like, covered the first order where the judge specifically says, you know, no one can publish, it was a reporting restriction, no one can publish in papers, oh, and no one can publish on Twitter or Facebook either. And you said, well, you know, at least, you know, he, he is trying to grasp the issue, but you know, how, how well, is that going to be enforced? Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I was reading a, an article from a, a, about cameras in courts, you know, ready, getting ready for this to do with the, U, the US article, and it was written in 2007. And 
there's nothing in it at all about Twitter or mm -hmm. Facebook, just nothing at all about, and it's all about publication in different forms of media, including, the, including cameras in courts. It doesn't even mention Twitter, and I think it would be impossible to write that article now and not talk about Twitter and Facebook and how, you're, how that's an opportunity for things to be published. It, it also causes a convergence of, of legal principles across the world over freedom of expression. How do you regulate your freedom of expression within your own domestic parameters when someone can tweet through a US Twitter account exactly that same information which would be regulated potentially differently under First Amendment principles in the US? And one of the factors in the so-called Twitter joke trial um, uh, on which judgment has been reserved is that Twitter did not exist when, what was it, the Communications Act 2003 yeah. was passed? Mm. Um, and, you know, to what extent should the courts decide that Twitter is covered by a communication that Parliament, if it had anything in mind, clearly did not have in mind? Uh, now, obviously, the courts are very used to adapting legislation to new circumstances, but is this adapting it, it too far? And, yeah, go on. Well, I was just to say, I mean, when the Ryan Giggs um, injunction um, was, was all the, the news last year, it was said that his lawyers were going to go after people who had broken it, and they were going to try and force um, Twitter to reveal who they were so they could uh, serve them with papers. But as far as I know, they didn't get very... I think we need cases like that to come to court before... We can't expect judges to, to decide what to do. We have, we have seen people charged with contempt of court... Uh, um, and it's possible with Twitter to find out who is one of the early movers, one of the first people to tweet something. Mm. You wouldn't go after everybody, um, and indeed you couldn't go after everybody, but you could conceivably go after the first, um, or the first person to have the information. Mm. Well, we certainly haven't had a boring evening tonight. We've had an extremely uh, exciting evening, uh, I think, and uh, uh, very stimulating indeed. Um, I'm sure Paul wants to say a farewell, but before he does, I would like to uh, give my thanks to Martin Beckford and to Matthew Ryder for giving us a very entertaining evening indeed. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. thank you very much, Joshua. And I'd like to thank Joshua and Matthew and Martin for, for their discussion this evening. And I'd also like to thank all of you in the audience for coming along and for participating and for listening. Thank you very much.